invite you in. Jesus, we love you. Amen. We can have a seat. My guy, thanks for the shout out. <laughs> love having kids in here. Uh, any families go uh, to family camp yesterday and still make it in here today? Hey, a couple. Welcome. We got home at like 9 p.m. last night. Our boys were toast, and so were their parents. And, uh, but I'm here this morning with you, and it's going to be a great morning. So, um, Hey, it is Memorial Day. So before we get, get started, I do want to take just a, a minute to acknowledge that we live in a country where a lot of people have come before us, many generations, uh, and many of those laying down their lives so that we can experience some of the freedoms that we have uh, to live in America. And so I wanted to take, uh, and by the way, that continues. You have family members who serve in the military. So I uh, want to take just a moment, just to pause and have a moment of silence and remembrance uh, for those lives. Thank you. And well done, kids. Very impressive. Um, it is uh, Memorial Day weekend. My name's uh, Hunter House, one of the community pastors here. I work primarily with young families, uh, young marriage, young adults. And uh, actually tomorrow, little plug, uh, my wife and I are going to be gathering a couple of different community groups uh, in that age range, young adults and young marrieds, uh, at our house. Uh, there's a field across from our house where we'll set up a volleyball net. Um, and have some drinks and some music, and just some time to connect. We know some of our younger generations really want to connect this summer, so we want to provide some ways to do that. So if you find yourself in that category and want to come hang either with your community group, if you're not in one, want to come meet some folks, come to our house. I am not putting my address on the screen right now, so you have to come talk to me afterwards, and I will give you the address. To those of you who live in my neighborhood, I am very sorry for the amount of cars coming tomorrow, but we'll, we'll get through it. Uh, hey, over the last couple of months, we've spent quite a bit of time in the Old Testament. We've done Esther, we've done Daniel. The last six weeks were uh, on an Image of God series in the book of Genesis. When we get to the fall, we're going to hop into Philippians, probably one of the most joyful books in the whole Bible, um, and we'll get to spend most of our fall there. But this summer, starting today, we're in an 11, 10 to 11 week series called Rhythms that we'll be going through. Confession. Rhythms is the hardest word for me to spell in the English language. I don't know that I've ever typed it without autocorrect, uh, but I grew up in West Memphis where rhythm was a language in and of itself. So that's why I learned to beatbox and to freestyle rap and to take a pencil and smack it on a desk and make beats. I have retired from all of those things, so don't ask to see them. You will not get it. But I walk in rhythm whenever I hear music. I've told you all this before. When the blinkers come on, like I just start making beats in the car for it. And I cannot turn it off. A couple of times you will actually see me sneak up here and fake like a musician and sit on a box and just slap it the whole service during worship and act like I know something about music. But did you know that the band up here wears these headphones, right, that go in our ears and really for a couple reasons. One is so that we can hear different instruments. Some of us need, you know, the acoustic guitar louder for some reasons or vocals, hearing how they're harmonizing. But also because in our ears plays something called a click track. And it sounds a little bit like this. This is the most basic version of it, right? It's a metronome. It's steady. It doesn't speed up or slow down. Uh, the first couple of times you use it, it is very distracting. Because not only does it have this, usually it's got extra beats in there, and it's got like this college sorority girl uh, leading us through going, chorus, verse one, bridge, to let us know where we're at in the song. I'm not lying. Like the curtain, you've seen behind it, okay? If you wondered why do we not do drumstick click-ins anymore, this is why. Because the ears do it for us, and they click in and tell us when to start. Did y'all think we're just that good that we all start at the same time? No, something is telling us. So the more you use it, though, the more it begins to fade. And it kind of just becomes a part of us, especially as the band gets really in sync with each other and starts sounding like one voice. It kind of plays in the background. And you sometimes hear, some of us will crank it up because we need to stay on rhythm like the percussion guy. 
but really you, don't, you just want it to be part of who you are so that it's keeping you in sync with everybody else, but you're not tied to it to where that's all that you're listening for. Because if we were to say every single word on the beat like this and play notes every time, it would sound terrible. We're not meant to be chained to it. It's meant to help us be in unity together so that we can play freely. Question for you. Is there a click track for the Christian life? Is there something that is steady and unchanging that may not tell us every single note to play, every single decision to make or word to sing, but keeps us going at, the pro- at a proper pace? leading and guiding us when to step in and when to step out, when to be louder, when to be softer, something that is so ingrained in us that it actually puts us in healthy sync with the other believers around us, something that over time just becomes a part of who we are and allows us to live intentionally and freely in the healthiest way possible. I believe with all my heart that the click track for the Christian life is the life of Jesus and the ways in which he lives, the pace, the lifestyle in which he lives. And there's something about when we orient our lives individually around him that the Spirit of God just begins flowing in and out of us freely and beautifully. You know, over the last 2,000 years, Christians have observed the rhythms of the life of Jesus. What was his pace like? When would he engage? When would he retreat? When would he go just to be with the Father? When would he work? When would he have conversations? How would he be filled up and dependent on his Father? Now, due to the fact that Jesus is both fully God and fully man, when we practice the things he practiced, they're gonna look a bit different for us, right? Just a couple of examples. The Word. Well, when we read the Word of God or study the living Word of God, that's one thing. Jesus was the Word. So the way that he interacts with God's word is very different, right? Or confession. He had no sins to confess, yet at the same time, he's, he continually confessed or agreed with God. Sabbath is another one. We look for rest in Jesus and in the Sabbath rhythm, but Jesus himself is true rest. And he rewrote the book on what rest actually is and how we find it. So for the next 10 weeks, really, we'll, we'll end with a prayer service uh, on that 11th one. But we're going to dive into these individually, and today is more of an overview as we talk about spiritual formation, but to be honest, Jesus and the New Testament writers didn't do a great job, you have to be careful we say Jesus didn't do a great job, right? Didn't do a great job at laying these out step by step in a user manual format. There's no list in scripture that says, here's all the things you're supposed to do, here's how you do them, and I think that is very intentional. For one reason... These things were very naturally ingrained to the culture in which they lived. A lot of people were practicing some of these things, even those who weren't following Jesus. They were practicing them in a different way or towards maybe a false God. But we get to actually study them and go through them. Now, one concern, a couple weeks ago, Mark was talking about work in our Image of God series, and he talked about how we can tend to uh, demonize or deify work. Y'all remember that? we're not careful, we can do the same thing with spiritual rhythms. We can demonize them and say, these things are just a big task list. I don't want to be chained to them. That is legalism. I came from a place of legalism. I just want to be free. I'm not worried about that stuff. And we can demonize them. Or we can go the other way and actually elevate these things to the level of God. And we actually pursue these things as the end goal. We look forward to Sabbath more than we actually look forward to Jesus. And so we have to be careful. It's somewhere in the middle of that. And the, this overview week, spiritual formation, here's how I would define it if you're taking notes. Spiritual formation for us as Christians is the Spirit of God forming us more into the image of Christ. He does that in a variety of ways. But it's the Spirit of God forming us more into the image of Christ. These rhythms themselves are not necessarily spiritual formation. They are doorways and pathways for us to experience formation with the Spirit of God working in us. We'll talk a little more about that, but you can see this visual. Just as a potter, you know, will use water to soften clay or centrifugal force and pressure to actually mold it, we participate in this formation process through these things so that God is able to mold us more into the likeness of his son. 
That, we'll talk a lot about the why each week. Why are we doing these things? Because we don't want this to just feel like a task list that is put on top of you because that will get to legalism really quickly. So there's a purpose for these things. One of the clearest places I think we see the why is here in Colossians chapter 2. I want to read first verses 6 and 7. Paul says this, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. And so notice really clearly the order here because order matters. The reason for walking with Jesus or walking in Jesus or like him is because of the gift that we've received. It is not to receive it. He says really clearly, as you've already received Christ Jesus as Lord, that should prompt you to walk in him, to walk with him. You're not doing it to earn him. He's given himself. Why wouldn't you want to walk alongside him in that? There's a lot to unpack. What does it mean to walk with Jesus, walk in Jesus? That's what this whole series is for. But we see this visual of being rooted and built up, which immediately makes me go to Psalm chapter 1 when we see this fruitful tree that's planted by the streams of waters, yielding fruit in and out of season because it's planted by the source. The New Testament word we might use for that is to abide in Jesus, which we'll actually sing about today. But Paul here is referencing this spiritual formation, that we would be rooted and formed and built up into the likeness of Christ. Now, I'll be honest, the spirit world and understanding that we are both material and immaterial, it's one of those things that's somewhat hard for me to fully grasp because I can't see it. And I think we can do the same two extremes with the whole spirit realm. We can demonize or deify. We can say that like, hey, I don't want to get caught up in all that spiritual cuckoo and like, that's weird. I don't want to be in all the feels like I'm human. I feel like I can feel my skin. I'm going to live here physically. And we kind of run from it because we could be kind of scared of it. On the other end, we can get lost in it and get so out of touch with, no, God has actually created me to be physical, to love, to serve, to live in this world and not just live in some spiritual realm. We have to be careful to stay where God has called us to say. And humanity for a long time has known and has sought after the fact that there's something else out there that exists. We can't fully see it, and there have actually been a lot of harmful practices to try to get into the spirit world, like witchcraft, divination, things that the Bible commands against. But I even think that when you look at our generation, which some of that stuff still happens, but even like AI and the metaverse, there's something within us trying to create something, this experience. It's TBD on how helpful or harmful those types of things will be, but I think we crave something that we can't see in this other world. And if you've ever gotten a taste or a glimpse of something that you don't fully understand, you know it does something to your body, to your brain, as you attempt to comprehend it. It actually happens to me all the time with one of the things in life that I love the most. And if you know me well, you know what I'm about to say, mathematics. Where are my math people? God's God's gift to this earth. Yes, God's chosen people are here. Whenever I see math concepts that are outside of my full understanding, I love it. What is this symbol? Infinity, right? This is one of those uh, for me. It's not really a number as much as it is a concept, but if you were to try to explain this to somebody, what is infinity, you can try, but you're going to have trouble, right? It, It just, it keeps going. For how long? For Ever. It keeps getting bigger. You can actually take this and plug it into limits and equations and see how things work together. Won't bore you with it, but it is magnificently beautiful, and I believe a gift from the Lord. But as finite beings, it is actually, I think, good for our brains to attempt to understand the infinite and the unknown. We have to be careful, but I think it's good to remind us that we are material and immaterial to try to let our minds go there. I do it with the universe, and I end up feeling like, I, I, I don't know, it just makes my body feel weird, because I think about how big is the universe? How big is, 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 I don't even know what to call it, space, like, where does it stop? Is it really still ex- expanding? And if it's expanding, what is it expanding into? Like, I don't know, does that not hurt your brain too? It hurts mine a lot. When I attempt to understand, like, what is my space? Spirit, what is God doing inside me? I get a little similar feeling of confusion and wonder. 
knowing that there's something happening. And I've always gone back to having a proper theology of salvation uh, is actually really helpful to understand what is God doing in and through me on this earth. So for centuries, Christian uh, theologians have explained this concept of uh, salvation using three major theological words. Two of them are up here, justification and glorification. And when it comes to sin, this is up here to kind of help us uh, define them. But part of the salvation experience is that we are justified through the death of Jesus on the cross when we put our faith in him, and that provides us freedom from the ultimate penalty of sin. Right? When, we, when we place our faith in him, there's something that he did to atone for us on our behalf that we could not accomplish. And that is a major aspect of our salvation story, for sure. And then you look over here, and this is what it, that justification secures for us when we put our faith in him, glorification. This, is, this one day when we will be freed from the presence of sin, it will be no more. There are many days living in a broken world where this is the only thing that gets me through, that I hold on to knowing this brokenness will not be forever. There's no way. Now, I'm not sure when it happened, but at some point in the last 2,000 years, the gospel got somewhat reduced to a certain prayer that you would say to get you out of hell into heaven, right? It's Jesus died, we want to live with him eternally, so let's pray this prayer. And let me clarify, I think receiving eternal salvation is a huge aspect of our salvation, of what Christ has done for us so that we can be free from sin one day. But there's no way that that is all of it. Because the Bible actually doesn't record this prayer of salvation that we're supposed to repeat. What you see is when people put their faith in Jesus, they begin to follow him. Even after he's already ascended, people start following, meaning they start obeying. They start living the life that he's called them into because Jesus' work on the cross wasn't just to save us from something, from hell, but for something, for something eternally and for here. And that's where this sanctification process comes in. That's what, if you know Jesus, that's what you're living in right now. This is our life on earth as followers of Jesus, where we walk with him, where we grow with him, where we live out of the spirit of God, so much so that he begins transforming us and the power of sin in our lives begins to lose its stronghold. As we looked at in Colossians 2, it said, just as you received Christ, that would be the justification, so walk in him. That's the sanctification process. And this is where the Spiritual Rhythms series falls, right here. We want to become more sanctified humans who look and act like their Savior who secured salvation for us. So just to make it clear, or make sure that it's clear, this doesn't mean that we're becoming more saved. This means we're becoming more like Jesus, which is something that he's called us into. Now, if you're wired like me and you believe this, then you might ask, but why? Why the middle? If, if what Christ has done on the cross is for me, I accept it, I get eternity with him, perfection will come, why bother with all the in-between? Why spend my whole life doing all these things or following these rules or whichever way you look at it and actually investing in that? And the reason I think that I think that way is I often consider the cost of following Jesus. What is this going to cost me? What's the cost of discipleship? Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a German theologian, martyred for his faith by the Nazis, and he wrote a Christian classic called Cost of Discipleship, where he shows beautifully that following Jesus is not necessarily some easy thing. It's the most fulfilling thing, but it's going to cost you something. How often, though, do we think about the other side and the cost of not following him, the cost of non-discipleship. And I don't just mean of rejecting him. I mean actually saying, no, we believe in Jesus. We accept him as Lord, but we don't participate in this middle stuff. Dallas Willard uh, calls that non-discipleship. And here's what he said that it costs you. If you claim Jesus, but don't follow him, it's going to cost you abiding peace. It's going to cost you a life penetrated throughout by love, a faith that sees everything in the light of God's overriding governance for good. You're going to be without the hopefulness that stands firm in the most discouraging of circumstances. When you choose not to follow Jesus, you're going to miss out on the power to do what is right and withstand the forces of evil. In short, claiming him, not following him, is going to cost exactly that abundance of life that Jesus said he came to bring in John 10.10. 10. John 10.10 10 is actually the verse I was teaching last night out at family camp. 
And it's that the, the thief, come, this is Jesus speaking, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life. And not only that, life to the full. Jesus' definition in other parts of Scripture of life is that we would know him, that we would know God and the one he, whom he sent, which is Jesus. So that's why we do these spiritual disciplines. Not because, like, they are our goal, but they open up pathways and doors for us to be able to experience the true Savior in the way that he wants us to, to experience life in him, to be made more into his image. That's why we're going to go through these this summer. And in such a materialistic culture, it's hard for us to see beyond the physical, but in so many ways, we have to remember that our physical and our immaterial are tied together. It's one of the beauties of being created in the image of God, being his image bearers. Romans 12, 1 and 2 teaches us that we're either going to be conformed to the patterns of this world or be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we're told to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, but you know what it says about that living sacrifice? It says that is your spiritual act of worship. They're tied together. Now, there are infinite differences between our phones and God's word, but I think one of them is found here in this conforming and transforming. If you think about one of the differences, this phone, what does it do? It listens to you. Here's what you talk about, right? And rather than trying to get you to think about or talk about something different, and it capitalizes on that, starts throwing ads around the things that you've already said to get you to double down and spend more money and heart and mind on that thing. God's word does the opposite. It pierces to our hearts and tells us the things we don't want to hear. It shows us the deep inner crevices of where sin is still trying to eat away, where our flesh is still trying to work. Deep down, though, don't we want that transformation? Like, don't we want to be different tomorrow than we are today? I have been on full-time vocational ministry staff here at Fellowship, actually, uh, for 11 or 12 years now. It's my first full-time job out of college, which means a lot of you have known me for those 11 years. And uh, many times after I preach, I hear the same general uh, comment from people. And they come up to me and they say, I have just loved watching you mature. And I'm like, I think that's a compliment. Like, I'm going to take that as a compliment. But isn't that what we want? Like, I don't want to be the same. Like, I want to be growing. That's one of the things about growing up in front of people is like, you're going to see how God is transforming me. That's the thing about marriage. You see how God transforms your spouse or your kids. Leaders are in process just like the people they're leading are in process. Parents, I don't have to remind you of this. Your kids are in process, right? Lord willing, they are transforming and growing and changing in different ways. Kids, guess what? So are your parents. In process. And we all need these things, not in and of themselves, but because they give us a way to experience and to pull away, to experience Jesus the way he wants us to know him. But in this, and I don't have to remind you all of this, but the scripture reminds us, so we're going there, we have an enemy. Right? This isn't going to all be easy. And Paul reminds here that, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. The enemy will use similar tactics throughout all time. They'll come in different forms to different generations. And boy, we could talk a lot about the, the enemies of our soul in, in 2023 and what that looks like. Uh, our staff team is reading a book by Lance Witt right now called Replenish. And there was a statistic in the first chapter that blew my mind. And it was this. One in 10 ministers actually will retire as a minister. Meaning 90% of pastors and ministers will step away at some point in their ministry to do something else. That doesn't mean all of them are stepping away for a bad reason, okay? That's just a st statistic. But what, what would you say are the main reasons that that's happening? And I think there are three major categories, especially from the negative sense. One would be a compromised theology, moving in a way that goes against Scripture, and you start to lose the life 
of ministry of the word working in you. Number two, unfortunately, moral failure is probably one of the biggest. It's the most public that we see. And then three would just be burnout. Whether it's burnout from church organizational structure, hard relationships, or the weight of ministry, people, ministers, pastors are stepping away pretty consistently. And here's what I've had to remind myself. All three of those are kept in check by authentic spiritual formation, by abiding with Jesus. That doesn't mean I'm going to be perfect, but it keeps those things right here so that I don't slip into them over time. And I don't think that's specific to ministers. I think the same could be said for all of us in here. Not only are you prone to those same falls, but you and I need these disciplines in order to see Jesus more clearly each and every day. But I do think perhaps one of the greatest enemies we face right now is pace and a lack of rhythm. Because see, without a click track for us, every day as a Christian is kind of just a shot in the dark. Like if you just wake up and go, I'm going to go live for Jesus, it's like, I hope you do something that honors God. I hope I do something where I can see where he's working. But when we're out of rhythm, we don't really have a gauge of knowing like, what is God doing? We shouldn't be surprised to hear that God has an established rhythm for the human life. I mean, think about it. Look at his creation. With hearts beating, lungs breathing, planets orbiting, the sun and moon from our perspective rising and setting, tides coming in and going out, birds migrating, seasons changing, leaves growing, leaves falling His fingerprints of rhythm are literally everywhere, everywhere. And his fingerprints of rhythm in our lives go so much deeper than just physical, just physical sleep. Our body, our soul, they're all tied together. There's something he does in a rhythmic way that transforms us. But what's happened to our pace and our rhythm in humanity over the last hundred years? You know, there's a reason that John Mark Comer and others are going all in on practicing the ways of Jesus, apprenticing under Jesus, eliminating hurry in a ruthless manner. But why? Why are they doing that? Well, Lance Witt from that same book that we're reading says that following Jesus cannot be done at a sprint. Just can't. Over time, we've developed lifestyles that have a speed incompatible with the ways of Jesus. And it's not all on you. A lot has changed in the last 2,000 years, but even the last 100. Let me tell you what I can do in one day, and I've done these things in one day. FaceTime friends in Europe, see a college baseball game in Arkansas, help guests check into an Airbnb in Montana, Venmo birthday money to a sister-in-law in Reno, stream a news story in New York City, virtually explore an underwater cave in Puerto Rico, because why not, DoorDash, Thai food for dinner, and drink cotton candy-flavored milk from the great state of Missouri. I can do all that in under two hours. That's a two-sided coin, isn't it? Think about Jesus' culture in which he lived. He would walk for 10 hours to get to a city, walking and talking and praying and thinking and dreaming. The pace of life is different. I mean, we see it everywhere. Think about the last three minutes of our service. We don't want to get stuck on this campus for 15 minutes. So before we even dismiss, we see a mass exodus of people from the back rows. Not today, because public shame will kick in. But (laughs) but maybe next week. Actually, I said that first service. They still did it. I didn't care. They were out of here. But for all of us, if you haven't realized it yet, the demands of this life will always exceed our capacity. Always. Always. And you would think that maybe the creator of the universe would have a hard time fitting us as individuals into his schedule, but so often it's the other way around. So as we talk about walking with Jesus, we have to beware of this desire for instant gratification that all of us have because we live in this day and age. The get rich quickly, lose weight quickly, get information quickly, find love quickly, those things rarely work out. And it's the same with trying to be like Jesus quickly or to follow Jesus quickly. We crave efficiency. I am the chief amongst sinners in that way of craving efficiency in my spiritual life. I've learned the game that the faster you move, 
the more you can get done, the more power you have over people. And that's a dangerous place to be. But we still try. In an efficient society, how do we efficiently become like Jesus? We can't. Richard Foster says that deep, settled, hopeful, steady people are an endangered species. Can't find them. So I wanted to have just a couple of reminders for as we go through each week. These are things that are good to remember with each spiritual discipline that we'll cover. We're looking for consistency, not efficiency. Okay? Consistency over time. Not do as little as you can to get as much output as possible. And these things are meant to bring us freedom, not enslave us. At the heart of all spiritual disciplines is an entry into joy and freedom in a life with Jesus, not something else to add to our plate to hold us down. They will require effort, but they don't earn you anything. Okay? Dallas Willard has a famous quote about grace being opposed to earning. Grace is not opposed to effort. Effort is a very good thing. It is a godly thing. We see God throughout Scripture, scripture effort and do things. But we do these not to earn anything from him. And they're to be done with him, but that doesn't mean that they'll be without difficulty. Your, your life is not about to get perfect and awesome over summer because you're starting to read a little more, pray a little more. But you'll have the, the creator of the universe walking alongside you to see more clearly what's happening in your life and around you. And it's meant to bring us abundant life today, not just eternal life only. So if you find yourself in this process, feeling the things on the right side, you might be, as Marcia said, trying a little more than you're actually training. Trying more than you're training. If you think about it from a half marathon perspective, back in April, I think it was April 1st, the Bentonville half was happening. Any of you just go out and try to run that? Like, maybe some of you are crazy, but most of you, if you did it, you trained for it. And we're called to do the same thing with godliness. We don't just go try to be godly. We don't just try to read God's Bible. Over time, we train ourselves to know more of who he is. So if you try to implement these things, right, just add them to everything that you're doing this summer, you're going to burn out quick. So that's why I want you to hear math reference number two, think subtraction before addition. Anything you try to add, you're probably going to need to take a couple of things away in order to create space to really experience Jesus and what he wants to, to teach you. Spiritual formation so often is about less before it's about more. The cool thing is, though, we get to do this together. Like, the more I do life in the church, the more I realize the beauty of having other people to walk alongside in these things. Yes, following Jesus is an individual thing. It's something between you, your heart, and his but man, it is beautiful when multiple people are doing that around each other and processing that together and talking about the things that God's teaching and helping each other get back on that click track to be able to call out and say, I don't think that's from the Lord. I think that's from your flesh. And we get to walk through life and do these things together. This room is full of people who are way wiser than me, way sharper than me, more successful, more educated, you name it. And I would love to assume that each of you has had someone in your life, preferably a parent or a grandparent, to actually disciple you and walk you through how to, to be in sync with Jesus. But I don't know how realistic that is for most of us. And so coming into this, many of you may feel like a rookie. You may feel unequipped and very ordinary. Well, guess what? Spiritual rhythms and disciplines are for really ordinary people. People who are married or single who work out of the home or work in the home, who pay a mortgage or pay a rent, who mow or who don't mow. Like, they're for all of us because God has created us in his image to know him personally. So in this guide, I hope you're able to, to buy one, pick one up, or you can always download one for free online. There's gonna be a couple of things each week as we go through. There'll be a place for you to read to get some background on the discipline that we're gonna be talking about. A, a, place, a place for you to actually process this with others, to open the scripture and to process what God might be doing through this discipline. And then some things to practice. Uh, and each week I would say, just pick one. Don't feel like you have to do everything. Just pick one. We're looking for consistency over time in everything that we do. A, a little over a week ago, one of the great theologians of our generation went to rest with the Lord. Uh, Y'all probably saw this if you didn't, if you don't even know who he is. His name's Tim Keller. 
He's a guy who, uh, in a lot of ways, mentored, seeing the ways that he viewed not only the scripture, but viewed the world, the way he viewed his wife, his kids, just learned so much from him. And even in preaching, this is one of the quotes that um, has always stuck with me from him. Every time you expound a Bible text, you are not finished unless you demonstrate how it shows us that we cannot save ourselves and that only Jesus can. And I think that Colossians passage does that for us. The last verses, after talking about this enemy, after talking about being rooted and built up in Jesus, Paul says, just remember, for in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. And he's pointing us back to the source. The reason you're built up, the reason you're going to practice these things, the reason you're going to pray and step away is because you're looking for life in Jesus. That's where it's found when we have a deep, intimate, abiding relationship with him. And by the way, as we talk about the pace of Jesus and mimicking his pace, him being our click track, he wasn't always just chilling. So don't think like Jesus is just sitting on a couch and we're just supposed to kick back and just let life go. No, he did a lot. He worked a job, right? He ministered, he traveled, he taught truth, he counseled, he discipled. But what we see is a rhythm in him where he would engage and then withdraw, where he would be in unity with people, and then he would isolate just to be with him and his father. I started thinking about this pace, and I got on a rabbit trail this week, which happens a lot. Um, I think it's ADD. But I sit in my office, and I was like, talking about the pace of Jesus. Did Jesus ever run? You ever ask dumb questions like that? Like, did, G- like, did he ever run? Right? Was he ever in a hurry, or did he ever go on a run? And all we have is what, you know, Scripture tells us. From what I can tell, no. So I've given you a great excuse the next, someone try, next time someone tries to bully you into a run, right? Just trying to be like Jesus today, got to say no. But did he ever move quickly? Was he ever in a hurry? And there's a couple parts in Scripture we might say, oh, you know, he slipped away. I'm sure he had to do that quickly. I find one time where it looks like he's hurried, one time where he might be let's just say, walking at a faster pace. And you could easily look over it if you're not careful. And it's found here in Mark chapter 10. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. Now, it doesn't say he ran, right? But something about his pace, he's now setting the pace for others. And something about it has made them scared, I don't know if it's because they've never seen it and they're like, we can't, we're running as fast as we can and we can't keep up with him. I don't think that's what it is. Look at what he's running towards. See, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. The only thing that we have a remote glimpse in Scripture to see that Jesus might have run or hurried towards was to the cross, was to swing open the gate for us to be able to have a relationship and experience the rest that he so desperately wants all of his people to experience, to tear the veil so that we might be able to bring our sins directly to God, to lay them at his feet, to not have to sacrifice anything because one ultimate sacrifice is already covered where we get to live real lives amongst others, not having to hide in the shadows. That's what he was excited to go towards. That's what he was moving quickly towards. So when we talk about these rhythms, they're not just to add a task list of legalism. It's to open the, the pathways to be able to experience him more clearly in a really busy world, to create space so that we can know the one true Savior. And I can only tell you that so much with words before you just have to experience it to understand him. And Lord, that is our prayer as we worship, as we go into this series, that we would experience you, that we would create space to know you, to be in relationship with you, to find out who you are, God, as you formed us, to be able to bring our hurts, our pains, to you, to experience forgiveness and grace and community and healing, to to be able to understand your word more clearly, 
God, to be able to experience the life that you've called us to, the one that you ran towards so that we could experience. 